So the opening question is, which generation are you? If you were here at the beginning, we asked the question, which generation is the best? We'll get to that in just a minute. There's a clear answer. It's obvious. But which generation are you? Let's bring up the generations picture here. I, I don't know how well you can see this, but the, several generations you should consider. Have you ever thought about which generation you are part of? The generations that are currently alive. I, the one on the, far, uh, on the far right here, it calls this the silent generation. That's often known as the greatest generation. Right, so ages 76 and up right now, that's one way of identifying that generation. The baby boomers, which is, of course, the biggest generation, they have the most people. If the most people are following something, does that mean it's the best? If you got the most people, you're winning? I don't know, maybe. Okay, baby boomers, so that's age 56 to 75. We've got here Generation X, Generation X, age 41 to 55. Wow, I am 41, so I'm just barely a Gen Xer. My wife is of the next generation, the millennials. I don't know which one's, boy, yes, I know which one's better. So uh, age 41 to 55, yep, yeah, let's hear it for the Gen Xers. We didn't get a lot of fanfare. We're kind of the, the humble generation. We are, we are proud of how humble we are. All right, millennials, ages 26 to 40. Uh, any millennials want to make a shout, maybe on the comments or in the room if there's some here? Millennials, they're, they're okay. They're okay. I don't know. And Gen Z, this one identifies Gen Z actually as ages 5 to 25. Some groups identify these as different ages, right? So depending on which uh, breakdown of the generations you look at. You might be one or the other of these. It depends. So which generation is the best? Which one is the best? Now, like I said, this one, the first ones over here, they wrote a book and they said we're the greatest generation, right? Because they went through World War II and all this difficult stuff, very hardworking generation. Um, what can we say about the baby boomers? My dad, uh, a, a baby boomer himself, often told me we are the greatest, the best generation ever. And his arguments were rock and roll and change in society, right? The baby boomers brought about huge change in society. So, and they often have thought of this as like baby boomers were the hippie generation, right? And all of that cultural change in the 60s and 70s. Maybe, maybe they're the best, I don't know. Gen X, uh, my argument earlier for Generation X because I am Generation X, so here's part of my argument, all right? Rap music and reborn country music, and then we put them together. Oh, man, that's the best, right? Or if you don't like that one, we invented video games. Take that. You can take that to the bank. Uh, millennials, I don't really think there are any strong arguments for millennials being the best. Maybe, maybe there are. Maybe there are. Usually it's technology, right? Millennials are so good at technology. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty good at technology, too. And Gen Z, right, their argument is pretty much just that everybody else is too old, right? So they're awesome because everybody else is out of touch and too old. So which generation is, in the, is the best? Vote for it. It's super important to know which generation is the best. Now, here's the thing. Almost always, people vote for their own generation. I mean, this is kind of like, I was watching, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was watching, uh, this last week, I was watching Pirates of the Caribbean with my family. And in one of those movies, there's a scene where all the pirate captains, they get together and they're supposed to pick a pirate king. And somebody says, well, we've never been able to pick a pirate king for the last 200 years because every captain only votes for themselves. And then the pirates all go around and vote, and they all vote for themselves. Every pirate votes for themselves. That's kind of what it's like with the generations, right? We all just vote for ourselves or our own generation. Now, we also see it that way when it comes to how bad things are. And especially for Christians, for people who are following after Jesus, often it's been the case that each generation looks at the world and thinks, wow, things are so much worse than they used to be when we were young. You know, usually that happens when the generation ages some. Things are so much worse than they used to be. It seems like the Bible, like history that the Bible has predicted is coming true and the end has got to be near. And I think every generation of believers has looked at the world and said, it's got to be close. It's got to be that my generation is going to be the last one. Things are going to end here. And then, of course, so far, that hasn't happened. 
But every generation has thought it. Isn't that interesting? And in fact, here's something that Jesus said. He said once, speaking to his disciples, but I think also to us today. He had said that it would actually be a long time. A lot of stuff was going to happen before he returned. But then he looked out at them and he said, I tell you the truth. This generation will not pass away until everything is completed. What in the world did he mean? Today, we are in the last week of a series of messages called, you can say it with me, Not Home Yet. We've been in this series of messages for nine months. That's longer than I think any message series we've done in the past five years. We've been looking at the books of Daniel and First and Second Peter in the Bible. And we've been thinking about a lot of things. Last week, we wrapped up some of the points of this series which had to do with studying the word of God deeply and had to, do with, um, had to do with getting through, never giving up, no matter what was happening in our lives. We looked at Daniel's life. We looked at Peter's life. And we saw how their faith in God enabled them to walk through fire and their regular practices. So we looked at that last week and then we touched on, we touched on the idea of the end. We've gone through a lot of biblical prophecy things that were predicted to happen in the Bible and that still are. Some that have happened, some that haven't happened yet. And so today, to wrap up the whole series, we're going to do a very simple overview of all the prophecies that we've looked at so far. And I hope this is going to give you a kind of a bird's eye view, right? Each week in this series, we've been going deep. But this is going to give you a bird's eye view of what are all the things that were predicted in Daniel. What has happened already? What's still going to happen in the future? And 2 Peter as well. We're going to look at the end at some predictions in 2 Peter. And then we'll just draw a few points on how we should live our lives given the nature of history, where all of this crazy life, this human race, where it's actually headed, how we should live today. All right? So study, never give up the end. So we'll jump in first. Let's land in Daniel chapter 7. All right. This was the first chapter that really had to do with, we see Daniel receiving a vision from God of what's going to happen in the future. Now, some of what he sees that he, others around him had already had a vision for those things. Like Nebuchadnezzar had had some visions earlier in the book. We're not going to go through that. But we'll go through the visions that Daniel himself had. What's the greatest generation? Earlier outside, we were talking about what's the greatest generation. Somebody said the generation of Solomon in the Bible. Actually, that's, that's like somebody said that's a mic drop, right? What do you say after that? Maybe they were the greatest generation. Or maybe it's the generation of Daniel, those who survived his generation. Maybe it's the generation of Jesus. I don't know. Actually, Jesus has a lot to say against his generation. But here we go in Daniel chapter 7. So here's what happened in Daniel chapter 7. We had a vision, Daniel had a vision of four beasts, four animals coming up out of a chaotic ocean of darkness. And with the, first, the first animal was a lion with wings and then a bear that was deformed and then a two-headed leopard with a bunch of wings and then a monster that he couldn't even describe. And what was the point of this vision? Well, it was... God was showing Daniel what was going to happen in his region, in the Middle East, and sort of the whole, the whole uh, Middle East and the, what would become the Roman world over the next several hundred years, maybe 500 years into the future. He was showing Daniel what would happen. So the four beasts represented four different empires that would come. And we talked about that a bunch in this series, right? First, uh, the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans, right? And so a lot of this prophecy has already been fulfilled. God gave it to Daniel ahead of time. One of the things we said it shows us is that from hu the human perspective, we'd seen earlier in the book of Daniel from the human perspective, all of those empires, those nations, we would call them nations today, right? Like Canada and the United States and China and, and Great Britain, all these nations, human systems and empires. From the human perspective, they look marvelous. They look glorious. They look amazing. But from God's perspective, they look like deformed animals. 
Now, it's kind of a harsh thing for God to show Daniel, but it's showing us the heavenly perspective on what is happening right now on the earth. Even the best governments are deeply corrupt and turned away from the truth. So we shouldn't put our hope in those. The other thing we saw in here is that in that fourth empire that was going to come, right? It was clearly the Roman Empire, but we also saw, weirdly, that that empire would last until the end of the world. What? How can that be, right? Isn't the Roman Empire gone? Well, somehow, from the heavenly perspective, whatever started during that Roman Empire is still happening today. The kind of Western, modern culture that in fact is now taking over the world began under that fourth Roman Empire. And we saw that in the end of that empire, there would be someone who would come who the Bible would later refer to as the Antichrist. Some very powerful ruler is going to come at the end of the world and just devastate the world. So we saw that happening. We also saw in Daniel 7 this vision of the Son of Man. And this is an important term because this is how Jesus would eventually, later, way after Daniel, 500 years after Daniel, Jesus would use this term, referring back to Daniel 7, to describe himself. Jesus often said to people, talking about himself, he would start out, the Son of Man. And at one point he said, referring directly to this, what happens in Daniel, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. And that's what we see in this vision that's given to Daniel, that eventually this Antichrist would come, wreck the world, but then the Son of Man would come. And the Son of Man would end all evil in the world. He would be ushered into the presence of God himself, and he would be worshipped. He, in fact, would be God, even though he's also different than God. Interesting, isn't it? All the way back in the Old Testament, what Jesus would teach is prefigured. It's shown ahead of time. All right, so that's some of Daniel 7. Let's jump into Daniel 8. What did we see next? In Daniel 8, we had, Daniel had another vision of a ram and a goat. Now, this one was just about two of those particular empires. There would be a ram, and that ram was representing the Persian Empire, which would be massive and last for a long, long time. But it was also kind of slow, the Persian Empire. They had huge armies with tons of slaves. The Persian Empire was the ram, and then would show up this goat, and the goat in the vision is super fast. The goat can run across the whole Middle East in the blink of an eye, and he comes and he slams into this ram and destroys the ram in one move. The goat, of course, represents, when we look back through history, it represents the empire of Alexander the Great, the Greek empire that was to come. And this is just how Alexander did it. No one could believe what happened. Everybody back then thought that the Persian Empire would last forever. And then in the span of maybe 10 years, Alexander the Great shows up and absolutely destroys the whole thing. He takes it over. He has, he, his army isn't even nearly the size of the Persians. Uh, no one thinks they can do it, but they absolutely destroy the Persian Empire in a very short amount of time. They show up like a thief in the night. Nobody expected it. And boom, their whole world is different. This is prefiguring for us what will eventually happen in the end as well. So the Persian and the Greek Empire. But we also see there's this prophecy that after the, uh, you know, after the goat destroys the Persian Empire, it's going to be his empire is going to be divided into four, which happened to Alexander's empire. And then eventually someone will come who's kind of like the Antichrist. During that Greek empire, someone would come who was really terrible and attacks the people of God and wrecks the world. He's not the final Antichrist. He's this guy we talked about during the sermon series. In history, he, he was the guy Antiochus Epiphanes, this king of, of the uh, Seleucid Empire of the Greeks, one of the four empires. And he did a lot of awful, awful stuff. And so some of this is about him, but then the angel goes on to say, talking about this Antichrist, that he'll eventually take over the whole world and he'll, he'll wreck everything. And then the angel tells us that the prophecy is about the end of the world. So we see again, he's prophesying things that are going to happen at a particular point in history. And then all of a sudden he's talking about the end of the world, which still hasn't happened yet. 
This happens over and over again in the book of Daniel. Jump into Daniel 9 now. Let's check it out what happens in Daniel 9. Similar thing. Daniel 9, the main prophecy that we looked at here is called the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And this prophecy, we called it sort of the cornerstone or keystone prophecy of the whole Bible in some ways. Because this prophecy predicted specific details about the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, and it predicts specific details about the end of the world. In fact, it even gives us some kind of time frame. Now, it doesn't tell us when the end of the world is going to happen, but it tells us the amount of time that will happen, that things will happen in right before the end. So we saw one thing that happens in this, in this prophecy. It's divided first into 69 weeks or 69 sevens of years, which is a strange thing to us, but was very normal for the Jewish people, the Hebrews, to think about this way. Seven years, 69 periods of seven years. And then at the end, there's one period of seven years. So 69 plus one is 70. The first 69... If you look at history and what happened, those first 69 sevens of years predict to the day, the date that the Messiah would enter the city of Jerusalem, which has already happened. They then predict that the Messiah would die and that there would be this long period of time in between the coming of the Messiah and the end of the world, our period of time. The period of time that we would think of as most of history. And that period of time is described as wars and desolations. So you can go back to this message. It's a very important part of the Bible. It shows us in a clear, direct way that we can trust Scripture. It predicted things with extreme accuracy ahead of time. Way ahead of time. But very, very accurately. So we can trust that it's from God and we can trust that the things that are still predicted to happen will eventually happen. We saw that this section also predicts at the end of time, a period of seven years in which the world goes through really, really difficult times. The worst time in all of history is still ahead of us in the seven years before the end. Jesus refers to this time as the great tribulation or trial, the great time of testing. It's still ahead of us. We also saw in this section that some things would be needed before this seven-year period at the end could come. A couple of things had to happen, which for most of history, it seemed very unlikely that they would happen. In order for this last seven years to happen, according to the prophecy, the Jewish people would have to be in the city of Jerusalem. And for thousands of years, people said that's impossible. The Jews are never going to return to Israel. And then they did. So some of this has even been fulfilled within the generations that we listed on this screen at the beginning. Within the lifetime of that greatest generation, the World War II generation, part of this prophecy has been fulfilled that people thought could never happen. There's still one more piece of it that has to happen, and that is that a temple has to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And many people still say, oh, that can never happen. It's going to happen. Wait and see. The Bible says it will happen. All right. So that's Daniel 9. Daniel 10 and 11, let's jump into that. So here we've got, uh, here we got a detailed prophecy in Daniel 10 and 11 about the kings of the north and the south. And this was an angel telling Daniel what would happen over the next three or four hundred years with his own nation, with the Jewish nation. And they were going to be caught in the middle of this battle between a king in the north and a king down in the south. And now looking back, we know exactly who those kings and kingdoms were. It was the northern Greek kingdom, which was known in history as the Seleucid kingdom. And the southern Greek kingdom, known as the Ptolemaic kingdom, the Ptolemies. And so the, there's details. We didn't go into all the details because a lot of it has to do with history that most of us don't know. But it very, in a very precise and detailed way, 
predicted ahead of time what would happen between those kingdoms. There's something like 30 to 40 specific prophecies in this section that have already happened, just as they were predicted. So again, we see that we can trust Scripture. And again, we see the angel looks down and says, and then at the end, at the end of this Seleucid kingdom, there's an Antichrist coming. It was this guy, Antiochus Epiphanes, we already talked about. And it gives a bunch of details about his life, predicts what would happen with him. And then it starts to give some details that could not possibly be true of that guy back then. Some details that could only be true of the, the final Antichrist who's coming. And then the angel again says, the prophecy is about the end of the world. It's about the end, the end of those kingdoms in history, but it's also about the end of the world that is still coming. And Daniel keeps looking at the angel and going, I, I don't understand. I don't understand what you're saying. Somehow to the angel, it's like all of these things are one. We'll come back to that. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to read Daniel 12. And then we're going to go and read 2 Peter chapter 3, which is the end of 2 Peter. And we're going to look at what Daniel... Uh, what the angel says to Daniel at the end here. And we're going to look at what Peter says to us about the end of the world because there's some prophecy in the end of Peter's book as well. And then we'll, we'll draw a few points to close after that. All right, here we go. So this is the same angel that's just been telling Daniel about those kings of the north and south and the Antichrist that's going to come and this crazy things that will happen at the end of the world. So when he says at that time, he's talking about the end of the world but maybe also about the time when the Jews were suffering a couple of thousand years ago under Antiochus Epiphanes. Somehow both. At that time, he says, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. Who's Michael? We've already heard about him. He is an angel, a being of immense spiritual power who protects the Jewish nation. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. This is, again, the great tribulation we've been talking about. But at that time, your people, the Jewish people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, maybe that includes us too, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Did you hear that? That means they're going to come back to life. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, some others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river and one on the opposite bank. Remember at this point, he's in the vision, he's at a particular river or a canal, and he's been looking at this guy who's literally floating above the canal, this most powerful angel. And now two more angels appear, and they start asking the more powerful angel questions. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who, who was above the waters of the river, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. He lifts his hands up. And then I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, it will be for a time times and half a time when the power of the holy people has been finally broken all these things will be completed i heard but i did not understand yeah me too daniel it's it's almost like a it's an overly climactic moment or almost anticlimactic for us the angels ask this most powerful angel when is it going to happen and the angel tells them only none of us can understand his answer. His view of history and how, maybe even how time works is so different from ours. He says it like we're supposed to understand it. It's going to be for a time, times, and half a time. 
Daniel says, I don't understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will be the outcome of all this? He replied, go your way, Daniel. Daniel, I get it. You don't understand. Okay, I thought you would understand, but I get it. You don't. Because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. What does this mean? We have no idea. As for you, go your way until the end, Daniel. You will rest. And then at the end of days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. That's a powerful moment. Daniel is sent away. He, he sees all these visions, but he doesn't understand them. Let's take away a few things from this, uh, this passage, Daniel 12. A few things I want to point out, and then we'll go to Peter. Number one, the angel is clearly saying that in repeated cycles and at the end of the world, the Jewish nation is going to be persecuted and attacked all the way through history. Looking back, we can see that that is very much true, can't we? We can see that it's still true today. Isn't that remarkable? That's predicted all the way back then, and we can see it playing out through the last 2,000 years of history and today. We talked about how every generation has looked at their circumstances and said, man, the stage is set. The end must be now. If you were living during World War II and you were watching how the Jewish nation was being absolutely attacked by the Nazis in Europe, wouldn't you have looked at that situation and said, Hitler has to be the Antichrist and the end is very close? Yeah, you would have. Were they right? I think they were. We'll come back to that at the end. Because this is what the angel predicts. The Jewish nation is going to be attacked, but help for the Jewish nation will always arise. And has it not? This is remarkable. This is astonishing. Help will always arise because Michael, their prince in the spiritual realms, they have some sort of special, powerful protector. That's very interesting. The next thing I want you to note that in this section of prophecy in Daniel 12, we see that there will be a resurrection of the dead. Now, this is something the Bible talks about many places. And Jesus himself, of course, has come back to life already. The firstborn from among the dead. But here we have a clear prediction from an angel who gave to Daniel all the details of history that have happened so far. We have the clear statement that one day all the dead, all who have ever lived, will come out of their graves. You, if the world lasts, you will one day die. You will be buried or maybe even cremated and your ashes sprinkled and that will be no issue for God. One day, this will literally happen. That all those who have died, their bodies will come back to life. You will again see all the people you have known and people that you never knew because they died long before you or lived after you. Can you imagine what that will be like? I was recently at my dad's funeral, his memorial. Just yesterday, I was at a memorial service for another friend who has recently died. Those people will come back to life from their graves. That is what the angel is saying. That changes everything about how we're going to live, if that's really true. The next thing that we can note here is that the scroll is sealed up until the time of the end. Some of these prophecies are just not going to be understood. That's what the angel says. But we will see this happening in our lives and throughout history, that many people will be made pure. God is going to direct history in such a way that he's going to bring back many people to himself, cleanse them, and make them fit for service in his kingdom. But the wicked will continue to be wicked. 
those who choose to reject God will continue to reject God and they will not be able to see the truth or understand what's happening. In fact, this is a very interesting point that even right now, it is only those who choose to follow God, who choose to say, I, I'm not the one to run life. I'm not going to live just for myself. I'm going to live for God. It's those people who are able to understand what's really happening in the world. Not anyone else. All right. Now let's jump into 2 Peter chapter 3 and we'll see what Peter has to say. Remember last week we talked about how he's just said that there will be many false teachers that are going to come into the world. And as the end approaches, that is going to increase. Many people who are teaching things that are going to lead lots of people the wrong way. And we see that happening both in the church and in the world in general. We see that happening today. He also has said that there are going to be many scoffers who would come. People who are going to think it's ridiculous to believe in God. They're going to make fun of it. They're going to put you down for it. They're going to think that's ridiculous. This is something people believed in the past. Those old generations used to have faith in God. All of us young people, young generations, now we know the truth. We don't, that, all that stuff is past. That's, that's the old way. Peter predicted that that would happen. And in fact, that it would increase more and more as we come to the end. But those who know the Lord their God will resist and stand firm. And it's very important that we do because here we see what's going to happen next. So starting at verse 8 in 1 Peter, or sorry, 2 Peter chapter 3. Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years are like a day. Didn't we see that with the angels? To those angels who were speaking, who stand in God's presence all the time, it was like all of this history that we're living through right now was the blink of an eye. And the big things to them were these particular events that would happen at different moments. This is God's perspective. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowly, slow, slowness. So some people think, well, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus came and he hasn't come back. Well, either, either he's not coming back or he's super slow. Well, you're viewing history a different way than Jesus does. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. This isn't just an ordinary kind of fire. Do you notice that here? He is talking about, I think, literal physical fire, but it's a kind of fire that will reveal things as well, not only destroy. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. There's an implication here that you might actually be able to help speed it up. Interesting. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. And the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. We'll stop there. We'll just draw a few points now out of 2 Peter chapter 3, and then we'll wrap up this whole series about not being home yet. Here's what I want you to notice. False teachers are coming, scoffers are coming, and then we see Peter tell us that even though the road is going to be long, there will be an end to all of this. Even though there will be many cycles throughout history, there's going to be an antichrist and then another antichrist and then another antichrist, eventually there will come the final antichrist the final great trial for the world and the return of the Lord Jesus that is coming. 
History is not an endless cycle. History is an arrow and it's going somewhere. That's very important for us to keep in mind as we live this life right now. He says that it will come like a thief. What does that mean? The end will come like a thief means that no one will expect it when it comes. No one will expect it except for the few who know the Lord their God. We said at the beginning that every generation of Christians has looked at the world and thought the end must be, it must be here. It looks like the time is now. The end has got to come during my lifetime. And so far, all of us have been wrong. But I want to say too, that all those generations of Christians have been right on. Because this is the way that God wants us to live. I think he specifically designed it so that every generation, it would appear like the end could happen at any moment because it can. And so we should look at the world now, look carefully at the things that are happening and say, just like every other generation has, this might be the end of the world because it might. And if that's the case, if the world is going to be destroyed by fire, as Peter has told us, how should we live? And here we'll bring up some of our last points that you can write down today. Peter says again in this section, which he's already told us at the beginning of the letter, he says this, if this is true, that the world is all headed toward this end, then you right now should make every effort. God has done everything for you in Jesus. He's given you everything you need to live a life that's truly godly, truly for him. But now you have to work. That's the way he set it up. You're not going to earn anything with God, but you are supposed to respond to him and make every effort. Make every effort to do what? Here's our next point. To live holy lives. That's how Peter puts it here. In chapter 1 of this same letter, he put it a different way. He talked about growing in our character. Add to your faith goodness, and to, to goodness gentleness, and to gentleness. He, he talked about all these character traits that we need to put on. But here, he says a different way. He says that we need to live holy lives. We need to make every effort not to just, just to go along with the whole world and the way that they go, around in circles that always spiral down into death and destruction. We need to make every effort to resist and go the way of God in our generation. It might be the last. And the final thing that he points out for us here, he tells us to do, is that we should look forward to the day. And here I want to ask you this question, are you looking forward to the day that Jesus returns? Are you? You might, you might answer that question and think, well, yeah, I'd be really excited if that happens. But are you thinking about it? Are you thinking about what that day will be like? Are you eager for it to happen? Or do you wish that you could hold on to your, your life here a little while longer? We've got to look forward to that day. And Peter said to speed its coming, to ask God for it to come sooner. Because that day is the only real salvation that we have. God is bringing all of history to an end and it will be a glorious new world when that happens. Let's pray and we'll continue in worship this morning. Our Father in heaven,